Hello everyone, Raif Darazi here, and this is your weekly roundup for the week of March 4th through March 10th. Today I'll be going through 15 articles covering topics ranging from the role that gut health might play in COVID severity in people living with HIV, accelerated aging in women living with HIV, a new approach to fighting HIV using RNA, and much more. I won't be reading the articles per se, but I will give you a brief summary and sometimes throw in my own opinion and or commentary. If you'd like access to the complete articles, all links will be available in the description box below. Okay, let me fix this chair because I feel a little low right now. Okay, that's better. <laughs> and we're back. Since I haven't been able to do a Dookie update yet, I haven't done so many videos recently because there's just been so much going on. Just know that Dookie is doing great. He's doing really well. He recovered really well after the surgery. Uh, the vet treated him so well and gave him great medications to prevent side effects from the anesthesia and keep him comfortable. I was actually really shocked by how quickly he bounced back and was behaving like his normal puppy self. Um, they removed the mast cell tumor and it was biopsied. I believe it was noted as a grade two, and um, which is good because it's not aggressive. And he also had very clean margins, which just means that they were able to remove enough of the tissue surrounding the tumor that they're confident they removed all the cancer cells. A big shout out and thank you to Peter Crab for a $58 super thanks on my Dookie video. Tan Anderson for $30 super thanks on the Eric Verdon interview and $20 super thanks for the last HIV news video I did a long time ago. David Stewart for $30 super thanks on the last HIV news video as well. And Robert Zahn, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, for $2 super thanks on the Jeff Taylor interview. I really appreciate you all very much for helping me to support my continued work on this channel. Okay, let's dive in. Number one, Forbes. Joe Rogan provides a platform to HIV AIDS denialists. Recently on Joe Rogan's podcast, a guest, Brett Weinstein, claimed that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Rogan also questioned the link between HIV and AIDS, suggesting party drugs as a possible cause. Weinstein, known for his controversial views, has now ventured into HIV AIDS denialism, arguing that other factors like drug use, poverty, and malnutrition cause AIDS, not HIV. However, the scientific consensus is very clear. HIV is the virus responsible for AIDS. While other factors may worsen the condition, HIV is the primary cause. Di denialism has dangerous consequences leading to unnecessary deaths and misguided policies as seen in South Africa's past. Today, thanks to antiretroviral therapies, HIV is a manageable condition and questioning its role in AIDS can be perilous. It's crucial to rely on scientific evidence rather than discredited theories to combat HIV AIDS effectively. And I believe Weinstein also quoted um, from RFK Jr., Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s recent book, where he talks about um, HIV AIDS denialism as well. I'm also thinking about creating a separate video that is specifically focused on HIV AIDS denialism so we can really dig into that. And I know that there's documentaries made and books to really be able to kind of like pull apart the misinformation and, and get it down to some facts so that you all are armed with those facts. If you ever get, you know, cross paths with this kind of conspiracy theories and whatnot. All right, number two, The Advocate. DOJ sues Tennessee over HIV-related discrimination in anti-sex work law. The U.S. Department of Justice has filed a lawsuit against Tennessee and its Bureau of Investigation alleging discriminatory enforcement of the state's aggravated prostitution law against people living with HIV. Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark emphasized the targeting individuals based solely on HIV status violates the Americans with Disabilities Act. The law imposes severe penalties on those with HIV, including lengthy imprisonment and lifetime registration as sex offenders, even for misdemeanor offenses. The lawsuit challenges these practices, arguing they discriminate against HIV-positive individuals and fail to consider modern advancements in HIV treatment. Hello. The DOJ seeks to end the enforcement of the law, remove affected individuals from the sex offender registry, and provide compensation for those harmed. Legislative efforts in Tennessee aim to address these issues with one bill proposing to remove the sex offender registration requirement for those convicted under the law. The lawsuit represents a significant step in combating discrimination against people living with HIV in the criminal justice system. Number three, Medical Express. Researchers are using RNA in a new approach to fight HIV. During the COVID-19 pandemic, mRNA technology proved its worth by swiftly delivering vaccines. 
Now, Emmanuel Ho, a pharmacy associate professor at the University of Waterloo, has developed a groundbreaking nanomedicine loaded with small interfering RNAs, also known as siRNA, to combat HIV through gene therapy. Those siRNAs capable of regulating gene expression demonstrated a significant 73% reduction in HIV re replication. Published in the Journal of Controlled Release, the study unveils a pH-sensitive nanomicrobicide that reactivates autophagy, the body's cellular defense mechanism, and inhibits HIV infection in vaginal CD4 plus cells, targeting both the virus's ability to block autophagy and its entry into cells via the CCR5 gene. This nanomedicine offers a promising approach to prevent sexual transmission of HIV. Ho emphasizes the importance of further optimizing the process and understanding autophagy's role in combating viral infections, which could also inform strategies to address antimicrobial resistance. Number four, Village Report. No backup plan. Funding for HIV self-testing kits ending in March. The funding for Canada's self-test HIV program, which has proven crucial in addressing rising HIV infections, is set to expire by the end of March raising concerns among frontline workers and community members. The program, known for providing INSTI self-test kits, has played a significant role in connecting with individuals who may not seek traditional testing methods due to privacy concerns or stigma. Despite its success in reaching marginalized communities and reducing barriers to testing, there are no plans for further funding beyond March 2024, leaving many wondering about the future of HIV testing accessibility. The self-testing kits have been praised for their effectiveness and have reached diverse populations, including indigenous and racialized communities, sex workers, and people who inject drugs. Frontline workers emphasize the importance of extending funding to ensure continued access to testing, treatment, and prevention efforts, especially in regions with high HIV diagnoses rates like Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Number five, iNews, patients forced to share anti-HIV drug PrEP amid massive jumps in STIs. As the demand for sexual health services surges and waiting times for appointments lengthen, patients at risk of HIV are resorting to sharing preventative medication like pre-exposure prophylaxis and self-prescribing antibiotics, raising concerns among sexual health organizations. The inability to access appointments at sexual health clinics due to increased demand has led to individuals to seek alternative solutions, such as purchasing PrEP online or sharing medication with others. However, this practice poses risks, including the potential for missed wraparound care and inadequate testing for HIV and other STIs. With sexual health services stretched to their limits and cases of STIs on the rise, there's a pressing need for improved access to PrEP and comprehensive sexual health care. Number six, Forbes. Progress stalling for children living with HIV, report shows. Over the past two decades, remarkable progress has been made in the global fight against HIV AIDS, with millions of lives saved in hospital wards once filled with patients now empty due to life-saving antiretroviral drugs. However, a new UNICEF report raises concerns that this progress is slowing down, particularly in preventing mother-to-child transmission. While countries like Botswana, Thailand, and Rwanda have made significant strides in eliminating this transmission, many challenges persist, including gaps in testing, treatment, and care, especially for children. Additionally, gender inequalities and discrimination contribute to the vulnerability of women and girls to HIV infections. Despite these challenges, there is hope through strong leadership, innovative approaches to testing like those seen in Rwanda, and continued efforts to address gender disparities in healthcare access. Number seven, Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research. New drug to treat HIV might also be used to block infection altogether. Exciting research led by the Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research and Gilead Sciences unveils a potential breakthrough in HIV prevention with lenacapavir, a drug that may only need to be taken twice a year. Initially approved for treating multi-drug resistant HIV, lenacapavir's new role as a preventive could revolutionize HIV prevention efforts, particularly for people who inject drugs. The research conducted in monkeys demonstrates lenacapavir's effectiveness in blocking HIV transmission, offering hope for a more accessible and reliable prevention option. Gilead Sciences is now planning a clinical trial to further explore lenacapavir's potential as a long-acting HIV preventative treatment. This development marks a significant step forward in the ongoing fight against HIV AIDS. Number eight, U.S. Embassy in Zambia. 
U.S. government delivers first shipment of injectable PrEP to Zambia. Zambia received its first shipment of injectable pre-exposure prophylaxis medicine for HIV prevention, becoming the second country globally, after the U.S., to offer injectable PrEP outside of research settings. That surprises me. The donation of 14,850 vials of injectable PrEP, known as cabotegravir long-acting, will protect 2,000 Zambians against HIV for a year. This initiative, supported by the U.S. government and Zambia's Ministry of Health, aims to provide equitable access to urban and rural populations. Injectable PrEP offers two months of HIV protection between injections, offering an alternative to daily pills for those at risk. This donation underscores the commitment of both governments to expand HIV prevention options and improve access. Number nine, Pink News. A shocking number of straight Brits believe they can't contract HIV. HIV Testing Week in the UK, organized by the Terence Higgins Trust, marks a decade of promoting HIV awareness and testing. Despite medical advances like PrEP and government goals for zero HIV transmissions by 2030, heterosexual individuals constitute nearly 40% of new HIV cases, challenging the misconception that only certain groups are at risk. A study by Newfoundland Diagnostics reveals concerning attitudes among straight Brits, with 3% believing they can't contract HIV and many neglecting testing due to misconceptions or lack of access. To address this, Newfoundland Diagnostics offers private HIV screening tests online and in Tesco stores, aiming to dispel myths and emphasize the importance of knowing one's status in combating HIV. Number 10, AIDS map. Unequal and inadequate, U equals U communication from South African healthcare providers. A recent study in South Africa highlights a concerning lack of awareness and skepticism among people living with HIV regarding the undetectable equals untransmittable or U equals U message, which states that those with undetectable viral loads cannot transmit HIV through sex. Despite being home to the largest number of people with HIV globally, South Africa faces challenges in effectively communicating and implementing U equals U in primary healthcare settings. Healthcare providers express fears that promoting U equals U could lead to increased condomless sex, emphasizing condoms as the primary prevention method despite evidence supporting U equals U. This disconnect between healthcare providers and patients underscores the need for clearer messaging and education to empower individuals living with HIV to make informed decisions about their sexual health. This is like a, a big example of healthcare really, really dropping the ball, not taking the science and running with it, but kind of rejecting it in a way and trying to impose condoms on people and not meeting the community where they are, what their needs are. And as a result of that, um, things going awry. I mean, we see it time and time again, and it's unfortunate that we have to repeat these same types of mistakes. Number 11, Helio. Invasive meningococcal disease risk sixfold higher for people with HIV. Despite recommendations for people with HIV to receive the meningococcal vaccine since 2016, they still face a significantly higher risk of invasive meningococcal disease, or IMD, compared to those without HIV. A recent study spanning from 2009 to 2019 revealed that the incidence of IMD remained six times higher among individuals with HIV. Shockingly, most of these individuals had not received the recommended vaccine or had an unknown vaccination status. Even after the 2016 recommendation, a significant portion of IMD cases in people with HIV occurred, indicating a need for better implementation of vaccination strategies and continued monitoring of IMD in this population. I remember shortly after my diagnosis of HIV and then consequently AIDS, um, that was one of the first things that my primary care doctor was talking to me about was, you know, can you touch your chin? to your chest without, you know, having a lot of pain or stiffness in your neck. That's kind of like a sign or symptom. And then also making sure that I was vaccinated for that right away. Number 12, Sign Mag. Study reveals accelerated aging in women living with HIV. Stephanie Xiao, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, an assistant professor at Rutgers School of Public Health, led a study revealing that women with HIV experience accelerated DNA aging, potentially leading to poor physical function. This study, published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases, highlights the unique challenges faced by women with HIV as they age and suggests tailored interventions may be necessary for improved health outcomes. The research conducted on a sample of 195 
HIV positive women aged 40 to 60 compared them to a group without HIV, finding that women with HIV aged faster than their chronological age. The study underscores the importance of understanding the molecular mechanisms behind accelerated aging in HIV patients to develop targeted interventions and improve their quality of life. Yeah, my, my follow-up kind of question to this would be, um, are they or they have they studied the impacts of things like diet and exercise and overall well-being and sleep and hydration on being able to mitigate the impacts of HIV on DNA aging and or reversing those effects? Because, you know, if you saw my interview with um, Eric Verdon, I'll put a card up here if you haven't seen it about aging. There's so much that we control over in our lives that can help mitigate aging and even reverse aging in a lot of ways. Number 13, South China Morning Post, India's HIV-infected children live at Haven thanks to a man's happy mission. Ravi Kant Bapadal, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, affectionately known as Baba, I can say that, runs a sanctuary in India's Maharashtra state for children and adults living with HIV, aiming to provide them with care and support. Despite facing initial opposition from locals, Bapadla preserved and built Happy Indian Village, a thriving community where residents engaging in farming activities can lead fulfilling lives. Many of the children who contracted HIV from their parents found hope and opportunities at the sanctuary. With access to free antiretroviral therapy, residents' life expectancy has significantly increased, and some have even started families with HIV-free children. Papatla's ultimate goal is to see the end of HIV in India, hoping to one day close down the sanctuary for good. And it just goes to show that not just providing um, ARVs and healthcare, but a holistic approach and really making people value their lives and have self-respect and self-esteem can, can do so much good. Then, rather than just like throwing billions of dollars at something. Number 14, Medical Express. Case study features successful treatment of the oldest patient to achieve remission for leukemia and HIV. City of Hope, a renowned cancer research and treatment center made history by treating the oldest person to be cured of blood cancer and achieve HIV remission after a stem cell transplant from a donor with a rare genetic mutation. Paul Edmonds, 68, received the transplant and is now considered cured of leukemia and HIV. This breakthrough, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, highlights the potential for curing HIV in older adults with blood cancers using reduced-intensity chemotherapy before a stem cell transplant. Edmund's case showcases the success of personalized treatments tailored to address age and HIV duration. City of Hope's expertise in treating older adults with cancer and HIV played a crucial role in his remission. The treatment involved a reduced-intensity chemotherapy regimen and finding a donor with the rare genetic mutation that confers resistance to HIV. While Edmonds experienced mild side effects, his achievement of full chimerism signifies the success of the transplant. City of Hope continues to advance research in cellular immunotherapy aiming to develop stem cells resistant to HIV and CAR T cell therapy to control the virus. I actually interviewed Paul Edmonds on this channel, so I'll put a card up to that if you haven't seen it yet as well. Number 15, last article, AIDS map. Answer to COVID-19 severity in people with HIV may lie in the gut. Researchers in Japan have found that individuals with HIV who contract severe COVID-19 experience significant alterations in their gut bacteria, which can persist for months after infection. These changes may contribute to both the severity of COVID-19 symptoms and the development of post-COVID symptoms, or long COVID. The study, while preliminary and in need of confirmation through larger studies, suggests that examining the gut microbiome could offer insights into managing severe COVID-19 and long COVID. Previous research has shown correlations between specific gut bacteria populations and COVID-19 severity and post-COVID symptoms. In this study, individuals with HIV and severe COVID-19 exhibited reductions in anti-inflammatory bacteria types, potentially exacerbating the inflammatory effects of viral infection. Moreover, those experiencing long COVID demonstrated sustained decreases in gut bacteria diversity. Larger studies are required to validate these findings and explore their broader implications, including whether certain microbiome characteristics predispose individuals to more severe COVID-19, especially among gay and bisexual men or people with HIV. 
You know, it's funny that I'm reading this article now because last fall, as some of you know, I had a lot of issues in summer to summer to fall. I had a lot of issues with gas. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to experiment by switching from Bictarvi to the new drug, Dovado, since it's only two drugs instead of three, and hopefully maybe seeing if it had an impact. I did notice after a month or so a marked di difference in the amount of gas I have. I still have a lot of gas. Uh, I've always had a lot of gas, but now it's like more manageable and it's more like to what I'm used to, whereas before it was kind of getting out of control and it was um, really bothering me. Uh, so it could have been the Dovado that helped it, or perhaps there was some, in, or it could be a combination of the two, maybe the impacts of having COVID and long COVID and how that may have impacted my gut microbiome. Anyway, so I told my doctor about it at the time and I have totally been putting it off, but she um, said that I could go in and get the materials to take home with me and to do a stool sample so that they can check my microbiome and see what's going on there and if there's anything that's treatable. So I actually just got that today. I have it here and I'm going to do that, do my duty and then bring it back next week. And then um, I don't know how long it takes to get the results. But of course, once I find out, I'll share it with you. Links to all these articles can be found in the description box below this video. If you would like to join my new mailing list, I'm just starting this now. Um, there's a link in the description box below. Once I get a good number of folks on the email list, I will start putting together, I'm thinking a quarterly email blast with updates on me, with teasers of what's to come, some news, highlights, events, maybe some upcoming clinical trials, perhaps share some thoughts on the state of things and some fun surprises. As usual, it's totally free and you get to stay better connected with me and my goings on. So send me your email so I have it. This week I am in preparations for the Elton John AIDS Foundation Gala and Academy Award viewing party tomorrow on the night of the Academy Awards, March 10th. It's an incredible annual event. Um, well, when you're watching this, it'll be today uh, when it comes out. It's an incredible annual event, red carpet, dinner, fundraiser, and Academy Award viewing, after party, and um, Healthcare Advocates International was the sponsoring organization that was kind enough to invite me, as well as Carl Schmid from Plus Life, as some of you are familiar with. Bo is going to be coming with me. He's going to be my plus one, and I'm really excited to share with you my red carpet look that once again, Victor Luna was kind enough to design a red carpet look for me. Uh, he did my last one on the red carpet at the GLAAD Awards in 2022 when I won an award there. Um, and in fact, kind of cool, this time Victor Luna will also be going with his plus one. And so hopefully we'll be on the red carpet at the same time. So if I'm talking to press, I can show them my look and then also have the designer right there to kind of um, make that connection as well. If you're not familiar with Victor Luna, he was on Project Runway. He's also living with HIV. And so this is just a, such a cool, like creative, you know, universe coming together collaboration that we've been doing. And I hope to continue with him because he's um, a really amazing person. I'm going to bring my little uh, DJI Pocket 3 that I just got and I'm excited about. Where did I put it? Oh, I think I have it stored away. So this guy is so small. It's, it's on a, it's got a little, it's got a gimbal, which is just a fancy word for a um, camera stabilizer it turns on really easily very cool so hopefully i'll get some um, bts footage uh, on the red carpet for you and i'll share that with you obviously i know there's been very little content from me lately as some of you are aware at the beginning of february i flew to istanbul turkey i probably should have started with this so i could explain why my head looks the way it does and my hairline looks the way it does hence the shaved head um, and it's also like pink here where it's still healing. I basically lowered my hairline by about an inch or so. And from what I'm told and everywhere that I read online, this hair that has been transplanted here is expected to shed. It's been a month now, so it might continue to shed for another couple months. And then at that point, at around like the six month mark, four to six month mark, I should start to see like the hair growing back and then the fullness in its totality by like 10 to 12 months out. So for a while, I'm gonna be in a little bit of an ugly duckling phase, but whatever, I'll get over it. All right, last thing that I'll cram into this video, the uh, Telegram group Thriving with HIV is still alive and well. We've got over 1200 people there now. Please join if you're someone living with HIV and you'd love to be surrounded in a community of others um, who are also living with HIV so you can chat, ask questions, give advice, you know, just commune together 
there's a bunch of different rooms with different subjects like romance and dating and science and exercise and fitness and all the things and also you can do it completely anonymously you can make up a name if you want so please join i'll have the link to that below as well be sure to like this video subscribe hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out and please share this with anyone who might find value in this content those are the best ways that you can help support me and my channel until next time cheers I don't feel too